and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Writers Toolshed. It's Richie here today, and I'm delighted to be reunited with my very good friend, J.M. Williams. Hey, hey. How's it going, J.M.? It's been a little while. Yeah, uh, it's been it's been it's been a while. Um, it's good to be back. We've got a lot going on over at Of Metal and Magic Publishing uh, that has been keeping me busy. Got several books that I'm working on editing. Um, we also got some author publishing news to share, which is pretty exciting. One of our authors, E.A. Robbins, had a story picked up in an, an anthology, and that that anthology is available now. It's called Spirit. It's by Dragon Soul Press, and she's got a story in it that's about uh, post World War II Cold War shapeshifters. Pretty, pretty weird, pretty interesting. Um, interesting. I also received an acceptance for one of my stories in an anthology that isn't out yet. Um, it's still being edited. And I don't know what the official title is going to be, but it's by a uh, publishing, indie publisher called LaGrange Books. And it's a, a fantasy anthology that's set based on the theme world building. So all of the stories in the anthology have some sort of political element to them. So that's kind of cool. Nice. And uh, then, congratulations. yeah, thank you. And then kind of the last bit is b- bit of news. And I can't say too much at this point, but we picked up, we recently contracted an author for a, a novel, which is, I think it's going to be our first novel, new novel that isn't set in our core universe. So it's a totally new story in a totally new world. And um, I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm working with the author right now. Uh, she's working on some short stories that are set in the same world. So basically the same thing we've done with our core universe. When we bring in new authors and new new stories, we, we like to try to expand the world and to and to kind of really dive in, dive deep into those settings. So I'm working with her to, to expand some of the stories she's written into short stories, and then also might uh, open it up to dabble with other folks once the book is out and and you know people react to that world. So it's pretty exciting. What about what about yeah. you? Richie? What's going on with you? I've uh, I've been getting back into writing fiction again. It's been a little while since I've uh, I've been written anything creatively. Been very much absorbed by marketing with Pariah's Lament coming out. But uh, I've just finished a short story which I'm planning to submit to the British Fantasy Society competition, Ooh. which closes next month. It's it, 30th of June, it closes. I think everyone should enter. It's only a five, five pounds to enter. Um, really uh, great judges this year. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's been interesting. Again, that's uh, what you were saying there about writing short stories in a world um that's to sort of develop it a bit more that's what i'm i've been doing with the next world fantasy world that i've i've semi focused to so i'm writing a novella which i'm about half, halfway through and now um i've written a couple of short stories about just to sort of build it up and develop it a bit more and i think it's a really good good and fun way of doing it as well the thing you're working on now is this a brand new world that we've never seen before? Uh, no, I, I I have written in this world before in previous short stories, but this is like a different time period, just focusing on one particular region, and it's all to do with my own incarnation of Tolkien's orcs. Ah, so I've, I've had a lot of fun playing around with that. So yeah, and then I'm doing a writing workshop as well. Um, on how to build a fantasy world next month after this great success of the last workshop I did. I think it was, I had like 300 people booked in for that one. But this one is, um, you have to pay for this one, unfortunately. But I hope, I do hope it's uh, it's going to be quite useful and I'm going to give you a lot of things to take away as well, like world building templates and um, guides and you get a free book as well. So if you do want to book in, Head over to Eventbrite and search how to write a fantasy world, how to build a fantasy world by uh, with Richie Billing, and then be able to get tickets that way. I'll also put the link in the description. What's the date but, on yeah. that again? 
it's Wednesday the 23rd of June. It is at 7 p.m. Uh, GMT. But you can book in and get a recorded version anyway. So it doesn't really matter what day and time it is. That's good. And, and yeah, that's we'll, we'll, we'll post a, a link in the in the description for this episode. Yeah. And also a link yeah. for uh, the Spirit Anthology too, since we have that as well. Yeah, busy, busy. But what we're going to talk about today is something um, that I see a lot of questions about. And I think, JM, you get a lot of encounter a lot of questions about them, uh, this particular aspect of writing a fantasy. And that's all to do with creating names. Yeah, it's not so much that I get questions. It's I see it done badly. Names, names and titles are, are something that it's just, common for authors to make mistakes so it's a good topic to dive into yeah and uh, it's something that i've written about quite extensively on my website partly because i have encountered so many uh, instances of it done badly and one of my pet hates i don't know about you jm is the random apostrophe i yeah i totally agree and <laughs> apostrophes are it's one of those things, I mean, every rule has its exceptions, but it's one of those things that you should avoid it unless you absolutely need it. Yeah, it is. And I think when it comes to creating names in fantasy, I generally follow some sort of garden principles and two, two garden principles in particular. And the first one is that clarity reigns supreme. And this is where issues like um, the random apostrophe um, sort of come into it because if the reader can't work out what the name is, it's just going to really annoy them and frustrate them and they may even stop reading the book. So that's why I think you don't need to put like a, an apostrophe in a name. Like it's just a bit, it's just really difficult. Like if you think about some of the the most popular characters in, in fantasy fiction, the names are really simple. So you've got Vin from uh, Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn, three letters. Jon Snow, easy. Brandon, Bran. Um, all these names are just really simple. So I don't really see the need to, to make them complex. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Jim? I think, I think complexity in names probably is another thing we've inherited from Tolkien. But the other thing about Tolkien is you pick up one of his one of his books now, and I think it's in the front now is a spelling guide and a pronunciation mm -hmm. guide. So, for example, in Tolkien speak, uh, if you start a name with a letter C, it's always a hard C. So like the name Celebrimbor is a C-E-L-E. -E. It's always a hard C. And then they they lay out in their pronunciation guide, hey, you start with a C, it's always a hard C. So we did the same thing with our OMAM or of Metal Magic core books, is we built a spelling guide to make sure that all of the exotic names are all um, using the same rules. And to that end, I didn't I didn't think about it at first, but we added a, I added a apostrophe because it it serves a distinct purpose with naming conventions in in of metal and magic core when you have two vowels that are right next to each other yeah you can use a, an apostrophe to distinguish between are those separate sounds or is it a diphthong so for example yeah. you have let's say i'm just making this off 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 the top of my head um t-a-i how would you pronounce t-a-i tie Tai, Tai or Tay, um, depending on your your spelling, your your reading pronunciation conventions, it could be Tai or Tay, but it's a diphthong. But if you read a word in like in Japanese, that's A I, it's per, it's actually two sounds. It's A E, so it would be Ta E. Ta -e. So how do you cool. how do you write that out, and how do yeah. you distinguish between it being two sounds or being a diphthong? You've got it. The way that, that I came up, the system I came up with was using apostrophe. So ta e would be T A apostrophe I. And that just distinguishes there is a break between those two vowels. Yeah, that makes um, sense. So I think that 
goes back to you, but it goes back to your guiding principle of, of clarity that makes it clear how do you pronounce, once you know the system, it's clear how you pronounce that name. I think there's a lot yeah. of amateur writers that just throw apostrophes in a name to make it look fantasy, but they're yeah. not necessary. Like after a consonant, before a vowel, where there's already a natural kind of sound break, they throw in an apostrophe to make it look fantasy and it doesn't, yeah, it's distracting. Yeah, you stumble over the, the name. But it's also, uh, from a writer's perspective, if you put, if you make the name too difficult, it's an absolute pain in the, the backside to have to type it out all the time. Yeah, and it, it, and it's it slows the reader down because they have to, every time they, they hit that word, they, they're naturally going to slow down as they have to go through their thought process of, of, okay, how do I pronounce this again and whatnot? So I totally agree with you. If, if you have the option, simplify the names. Use Vin and, and John and Kira and yeah. things like that. Um, but when you get to oh. place names and things that are going to be a little bit more extravagant, then, then you want to have a system in place of how you're actually spelling these things. Yeah. I think definitely for protagonists in particular, like a name that's going to consistently crop up. I think it should be nice and simple. So I we were saying Pug sounds like a mad name, but it's he's one of the most famous characters in, in fantasy fiction now, Raymond Feist, um before saga. But so that's the kind of principle I followed in Prior's Lament. So I've got Izzy, just three letters. And it's just for, for protagonist in particular, it's really good. Uh, we'll come on to characterization, um, characterizing through names shortly. But I think if you, when, when we don't have as, as sort of much to play around with uh, for certain characters, particularly secondary characters, I think giving them a name that, like, we'll, we'll talk about titles and things, that sort of gives the reader an image of what the, this character's like without really saying much at all. So using unusual and unique names can can be um, can be good there. But I think for the protagonists, simple is always best. You were, you were uh, mentioning to me before you had another pet peeve, and you you gave me Game of Thrones as an example. Yeah, yeah, uh, similar sounding names always gets me. That's like I have to. I find myself going back, checking to see which character's which. So, and I think one of the best examples is in Game of Thrones when you've got the wildling um, character Asha. Is it? I think it was Asha. Um, and then um, the young Greyjoy sister is Osha. I probably got them mixed up. <laughs> but either way. Um, Theon Greyjoy's sister in the HBO series, her name was changed to Yara because it was Ooh. too similar sounding. So I didn't even, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. So, so that's just an example of of the danger similar sounding names. So again, it, it just ties back into clarity. Just you just got to make it clear for the reader. You don't want to, in any way, shape, or form, piss your reader off and make them frustrated. So that's why I think particularly when it comes to fantasy and conveying things like magic systems and details of worlds and names, clarity is always the best principle to follow. No, that's a good point. Um, do you use, uh, do you ever use surnames in your stories? I'm not a massive one on surnames, to be honest. Um, I don't really recall ever using the surname. <laughs> what about you? So th- I don't, I think part of it depends on the time period. So Call of the Guardian takes place in a very kind of ancient, like just gone of the Iron Age time time period. So surnames, like they come, come out historically, I think most kind of in the, the late ancient, early kind of Middle Ages period, when you've got yeah. a higher population and you need to distinguish a between people like in the past you have a name and then maybe like 
the place you were from or the place you're born, you know, John yeah. of Calendine. Um, but as society grows and populations grow, then you start having surnames because you got more Johns than one in the, in the village. So you've got John the Baker and John the Smith and, J- and John the, yeah. the Cobbler. And now you've got John Baker, John Smith and John Cobbler. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's where a lot of names come from. Like I, particularly place name so my surname is billing and that is uh comes from a, a place not far from liverpool called billinge so that's just an example there of, of how names can sort of develop over time but like you said like what you said it, it does come from say like john of winchester things like that titles yeah i, th- I think the most recent story that, that short story that I had picked up for an anthology, I used a surname just because it was dealing with like a princess and yeah. it was established, you know, establishing her kind of lineage or something like that. So I found it, you know, important, yeah. but I mentioned it once in the story and I, and I never go back to it. Like it doesn't serve any other purpose other than okay she's of a certain family yeah i think one of the best examples i've come across in fantasy fiction when it comes to names is game of thrones because the hat the names carry legacies and the houses so like lannisters starks yeah uh, Pirelles, like and he that what we're talking about there about medieval names and and things like that, like the Tudors and the Windsors and things like that. That is where George R. R. Martin got the inspiration from for his Lannisters and Starks. And the War of the Roses, right? Like the War of the Roses, exactly. Yeah. So it's um it's a really good way of doing it, especially like from a, if you're building the world and you're looking to add different sort of strata of society. Using these surnames, particularly grand surnames, um, can, can help sort of build that cultural structure. And the flip side, the flip side of that. It, it, so it's, I think the big thing is the time period of your story. The further you go in the past, the further you are removed from surnames. And the flip side of that is, in a modern setting, you're going to use a lot of surnames just because of how we interact in a modern setting. We say. We call you know, you call somebody Mr. Smith. That's not a personal colleague of yours. You call him Mr. Smith. You don't call him John. So in a modern setting, you're gonna have a lot of a lot of Mr. Smiths and a Mr. Brandywines and, and whatnot. And you're gonna have to have surnames. And that's just kind of a modern convention, our our kind of customs and courtesies and how we interact in a modern industrialized world. Yeah. And what do you think then about titles? So titles are another another thing that can be useful, but also be problematic. So I think, like like you said, with historical kind of that medieval political historical type fantasy novel, you can use surnames, but you can also use titles to establish hierarchy and uh, kind of political structures and things like that. Um, the thing that I've seen as an editor is you need to understand what the titles mean and what they're used for. Um, So for example, um, a knight. A knight is not just a guy in armor. Like you see in like, if you you use the word knight to refer to just like some guy in armor that's like a guard or a soldier or something, then you've create you've turned your story into a children's story because that's how children's stories per- portray knights, right? What is a knight? A knight yeah. is a a landed lord who is a a retainer of a king or some sort of higher ruler. A, a knighthood is a is a lordship that comes with land. It comes with authority. Um, yeah, knights knights go out and they fight battles, but they also bring armies with them. Um, so they're not just like individual soldiers. So, and that's something that I that I that I saw, um, actually saw in a, a manuscript once. So understanding what the what the titles are, what they mean, um, is important. But it does 
allow you to expand your world to, and then you can, you know, kind of create some uniqueness by um, dabbling with different types of titles. Um, trying to think of random examples, you know, like, like a uh, counselor or, uh, and one thing that we did with Of Metal and Magic, and this, we'll get into this a bit more, but we used our kind of our name reference point to also generate titles. And um, yeah. So, I mean, why don't we just jump into that? Um, where, do, where do you get your name ideas from? Name ideas. See, I, I'm pretty random with my name ideas. I do, uh, sometimes uh, I take real names and I'll just play around with vowels and just um, A E I O U, just change them around and see if you can make it a bit more unique looking, a bit more interesting. So I do, that's one method. Um, sometimes I'll just look around me and if there's any sort of labels or signs or any bit of writing at all, I'll just take words and just break words apart and mash them together. And uh, that's one way to, um, what about you? So I'm a, I'm a bit more systematic with the way I go about finding names usually. Um, so one thing you can do is you can go online and you can just Google fantasy name generator and you can find oh, a bunch cheap. of web page, web pages that, generate ran random names for you. But the thing that I do, if I ever use a name generator is I generate some base names and then I always change them. Yeah. So I, I, I change some of the letters around. I usually, I usually trim them because they usually come out very, they come out longer than I like. So I trim them down, I change them, but that kind of gives me a, a seed that I can work with. Um, the other, another way is to choose a, choose a kind of cultural reference and yeah. then go dive into names from that culture. So for example, in, in the Valley of Magic, I have, I use two different cultural references for names. Um, for the upper class, I use uh, old Saxon names and I, I just go through a database of old Saxon names. And yeah. then um, for the lower class, I used old Norse names. And that way you've kind of got uh, it, each kind of side of the society kind of sounds a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is what we do with of metal and magic is you can choose a language as your reference point and you can just like go on Google translate and this kind of gets into our next topic, which is the meaning of names. So um, you can say, okay, this guy, I, I want his name to mean eagle. And then in Of Metal and Magic for the kind of the Middle Ages period, the dominant political force is kind of a desert um, kind of Arabic type culture. So using Arabic as a reference language, going on Google, Google Translate and putting an eagle and seeing what that sounds like in Arabic and then just tweaking it to make it a usable name. And now I've got a guy whose name means eagle. And that way, all of the names are all coming from the same language source and are all going to sound similar. They're going to they're gonna fit together more than if I just come up with them on ran at, completely at random. Yeah. Let's go. Cool. And yeah, uh, along, with, along the lines of with meaning, um, if you're using a cultural reference, so that's what I would do is for in the Valley of Magic, when I was picking a, a name for one of the arist aristocrats, I would go through the database of old, old Saxon names. And I'd, I'd find one where the meaning was appropriate for that character. And I'd pick that, pick that name. So uh, Do we use baby books? Because I always remember watching this video with George R. R. Martin, and he was saying that he used a lot of baby books. So it's essentially that's what the the name reference websites are. They're essentially baby books. They're just not actual books. So you can you can choose like Irish names or Arabic names or Indian names or 
or Celtic names or whatever that you any sort of reference cultural reference you want you can you can get a list of names and a lot of the databases are are baby name websites yeah there you go and then you get the meaning they tell you what the meaning is yeah that's really cool so another thing we wanted to talk about jay was naming fantasy places so cities and worlds so i don't know about you i remember trying to name my fantasy world and it was just i really struggled with it it took me absolutely ages and one thing i ended up doing was taking a look at um obviously the names of other worlds which we'll keep too shortly but um I, i ended up looking at latin names for things like um land and stuff like that and that's where i came up with the name tervia which is sort of um similar to terra which is t e w r a which is uh meaning land i think in latin so mm-hmm. um have you got any sort of um tips or techniques that you adopt when it comes to naming places in fantasy i i don't think i'm as good with naming places as i, as I i'm not as systematic with naming places as i am with characters and I think I haven't done as good of a job, um, but I do think it's important. And I think you can use place names to give a sense of, of kind of culture and identity for that location. So in, in the Valley of Magic, there's three, three main city states and the story takes place in the city of Marudal, and I can't tell you what that means because that's like the whole point of the book. So you have to read the book. But the other yeah. uh, city states, one is Kingston. And the characteristic of Kingston is that it's the last kind of outpost of monarchy. There's still a king in Kingston and it's still very arist- aristocratic. So that's like its defining characteristic. So it's Kingston, the town of kings. And then um, there's a coastal city state called Odessia. And when you hear when you hear Odessia, do you get any any vibes from that from ancient, that ancient Greece? Exactly. So it's a it's a Greek inspired kind of seafaring city. Um, that was the point I wanted to convey. I wanted it to instantly convey that sense of a kind of Mediterranean port city. Um, yeah. So that that's kind of as far as I've gone through the tech technicality of of place names um what about yeah. anything anything else i like to look at um uh, like sort of the giving you world a name that sort of relates to its nature so i think probably the most stand-up one for me is terry pratchett's disc world <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah i know you're a big pratchett fan yeah so, uh there's another one afc uh, Malazan, Neverland, like even Skyrim, Middle Earth. These are quite like they're quite evocative names. So and you can sort of suggest what the world is like. So um yeah. I, I've never uh, I, I don't think too much about um naming the world itself. The one world that I re- we really dabble in, um Soria, our of mental magic core world was given to me so i didn't have any play in that um but for my stories i don't really think so much about what the the world is named because i mean really in a kind of medieval or ancient past setting until you start exploring the entire globe like people don't really think so much about the world as a whole they think about their little region in it their country or their village or whatnot so I never really thought too much about naming a world. Yeah, that's a good point. You just do what's necessary, don't you, for your story? And if your story happens to be sort of a continent crossing expansive one, then you may need a name for the world. But if it's just like one of my stories, for example, is just set in one tiny little region in a country that's part of a bigger world, you don't really need to know what the name of the world yeah, um, and my novella, The Nightingale, uh, 
is set in a small kingdom, but it's dealing with kingdom level political issues. So you know the name of that kingdom because it comes up from time to time, the king of so and so, you know, king of whereabout. Um, but there's no, it's all internal. There's no external politics. So there's no reference to any other political entity. It's just not necessary for that story. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it sort of comes back to um, one of the principles I adopt quite a lot when it comes to writing fantasy, and that's whether it's necessary and whether it's relevant. And if it's if it's not, then it's going to be quite unnatural if you try and insert it into the story. So, um, yeah. So I think that that about uh, wraps up a little quick dive into bit names and fantasy. It, these are just some simple suggestions, really. Um, but they are most the most effective ones that we've both come across, and they've helped us out a lot over the years. It's fair to say. Yeah, and just to kind of reiterate some of the kind of editorial ground rules, um, avoid apostrophes if you can, avoid exotics, spe complicated spellings, avoid long names um, if you can, because those are just going to confuse and slow your writers down, slow your readers down. Um, the other thing I've noticed is read your, read up on your grammar when it comes to using titles and how you spell titles. So one common mistake that a lot of fantasy writers use is they, they capitalize titles and positions throughout the text. So like the king walked into the room and king is capitalized. That's incorrect. You only capitalize titles in two situations. One, when it's going coming before the name of the person. So when you say King Gregor, then you capitalize king. When you're using the title in conjunction with the name, then you capitalize it. And then the other time you capitalize it is when you're using it, when it's coming in dialogue and it's a term of address. So it's replacing the name. Um, so like uh, someone says, uh, here's your report, comma, captain. Then you're going to capitalize captain because that's, the, that's replacing the person's name. Um, but if you're using titles in your medieval fantasy, Make sure you go onto the grammar websites and you double check how do you spell stuff because most people get this wrong. And there's, it's a it's a cliche in fantasy at this point that too many things that are are capitalized that don't need to be capitalized, whether that's a title or a you know a cool idea I have for my world building, unless it's really important to call it out and and you can justify it being a proper noun. You don't um, you don't capitalize it. So, for example, mm -hmm. in Call of the Guardian, uh, the call, which is where the guardian gets his power from, um, I consider that a, a proper noun. It's a very specific kind of phenomenon. So that is capitalized throughout the story. Um, but I thought through that question of. Should I capitalize it or should I not um, before just doing it? That's about, that's what I can think of. Any other uh, writing faux pas when it comes to names or titles that you can think of, Richie? No, I think you pretty much covered it all there. Um, I've just said, uh, repeat my points. It's just keep it simple. Clarity reigns supreme. Um, if it, yeah, so if you're ever unsure whether something isn't quite clear enough, Always just err on the side of caution. Oh, and one more thing. Um, when you do start spelling your names oddly, uniquely, complicated ways, you end up misspelling the name later on. So we have a, we have a grammar machine that catches these things. And it actually, when you, when you run your manuscript through the machine, it'll spit out like a cast of characters and it will highlight you know, like you spelled like a a a e r n and then you misspelled it somewhere else and you spelled it a e r n it'll it will pull that out and be like did you mean to do that like you've got a con you've got a name conflict um but yeah. that's something that you've got to pay attention to when you're editing your manuscript is if you've got a a uniquely spelled name um 
make sure that it's spelled the same way throughout the manuscript. It's a very common mistake. So that's about it for today. Thank you so, so much for listening. Uh, I hope you found that really uh, useful and interesting. A um, little re recap of a, a few of the things we mentioned at the start. Um, I've got uh, my writing workshop on how to build a fantasy world on uh, the 23rd of June. Um, link in the description if you'd like to learn a bit more about that. JM, we put a few links in the description to do with your releases uh, and EA Robbins releases as well. Um, and yep. uh, I've also put a link to my full guide on how to create fantasy names, which you may find useful too. Yep. And um, I will put, we'll put the links for the spirit anthology. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a link for the anthology that my story's in, but I'm sure that I'm sure I will mention it again once that's ready for publication. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. So thanks again for listening, everybody. If you did uh, enjoy this, please like and subscribe and share this with uh, anyone you know who might enjoy it. Um, so from me, thanks very much. And if you write fantasy, bear in mind that we are always looking for um, short stories and submissions. You can find those on our uh, Of Metal Magic Publishing webpage. Uh, send us your stuff. Don't, you know, don't self-censor. Send it to me and I'll, I'll give you feedback. But until then, yeah. uh, see you next time. See you guys, everyone. Bye-bye.